This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by the Art Witch of Kita. Kita practices her art witchery to lovingly render fat, folkloric femmes, astrological archetypes, cryptids, flora, and fauna. In her Chicago studio, Kita turns her original artwork into prints, banners, stickers, and apparel, so you can adorn your space and yourself with darkly beautiful, fantastical femmes and images. And Kita sent me some of her prints, and they are so powerful and so beautiful, and many of them are embellished with gold paint, so they are truly something wondrous to behold. Follow Kita's inclusive art witchery on Instagram at Kita Chicago, that's K-I-T-A Chicago, and go to kitachicago.com to shop online. Kita art that's made at the crossroads of beauty and subversion. Today's episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by Witch Baby Soap. Do you like to dwell in the shadows but stay squeaky clean? Then Witch Baby Soap is the soap for you. They make fabulous occult-themed body products like coffin-shaped bath balms, tarot card soap, and crystal-embedded body butters. Their recipes are made with magical intentions, and they're free of all of those nasty things like sulfates and parabens. And now, you can get 15% off orders using offer code WITCHWAVE. That's WITCHWAVE, one word, on witchbabysoap.com. So get ready to wind down, lather up, and get some Witch Baby Soap products using offer code WITCHWAVE now. The world is filled with bewitching people, and you might be one too. Welcome to the podcast where art is magic, magic is real, and reality is stranger than dreams. I'm Pam Grossman, and this is The Witch Wave. Hello and welcome to the Witch Wave. Ooh, Samhain is almost here. Yes, I am talking about All Hallows Eve, the time of transition and liminality and spirit communion and ancestor veneration and fuck tons of candy. Now, I'm a chocolate peanut butter girl myself, but it's got to be moist peanut butter, okay? Yeah, I said the word moist. You can keep that dusty ass, dry butterfinger to yourself, thank you very much. I need the peanut butter cups. I need them. I also always treat myself to a dark chocolate witch from Lilac Chocolate here in New York City, and I adore a caramel five-star bar as well, if I'm being fancy, so now you know, but I digress. I do love this time of year because it seems the world, or the Northern Hemisphere at least, really embraces its inner witch and leans into mystery, and for many of us, mysticism. And I'm all about the candy and the scary movies and the costumes galore, but I do like to remind people that Samhain is also a sacred holiday both as a time to honor the spirits and as Witch's New Year, the first holiday on the pagan wheel of the year, which, like any New Year's celebration, is a beautiful moment to stop and take stock and reflect on the experiences, accomplishments, and lessons of the last year and to set shining new intentions for the year to come. 
This Thursday, I'll be teaching an online workshop all about Samhain history and rituals, which will be recorded for later viewing if you can't make it live. And if you happen to be in the New York City area on the night of Halloween itself, I will be leading a very rare and intimate Samhain ritual in person at Honey's here in Brooklyn. Tickets and details for both events can be found over on pamgrossman.com slash events or at the link in my Instagram bio at phantasmophile. Now, as I've been saying, ancestor work has become a really meaningful part of my witchcraft these past few years, and I've noticed something pretty profound as I've gone deeper on this journey of researching and reconnecting to my family spirits. And that is that this work has been inspiring me to honor and try and heal some of the relationships that I have with family members who are still alive here on this side of the veil. And that life-affirming element to the act of carefully contemplating and interfacing with death is something that I think gets lost when we talk about any kind of death rituals. Because absolutely learning more about my ancestors, remembering them, lighting candles for them, communicating with them, has truly made me feel more supported and strengthened. But it has also made me feel more present and more grateful for the life I have now. For the body I have now, which allows me to experience pleasure and sensory delights, and for the loving relationships that I have now, no matter how complicated they might be. Because I'm reminded that our time here on Earth, at least in these current corporeal forms that we have, is fleeting. And so I want to engage in this life and these material spiritual relationships as much as I am able to here in the present. And that's a great gift of Samhain and one of the greatest gifts of witchcraft on the whole as far as I'm concerned. That this path gives us space and language and deities and practices to honor our dead to open portals that allow us to step into the spiritual realm, and to pay tribute to darkness, grief, death, and eternal, albeit shape-shifting, love. Because in doing so, our lives become so much more vibrant and embodied and appreciated. Speaking of vibrancy... I am so honored that I got to talk with today's guest, Naja Lightfoot, who has such a joyful and wise perspective on witchcraft and on spirit work overall. But before we get to that, first let's check and see what's come through on The Witch Wire. Who is it? Witches! Hope writes... I am a big fan of the show. It's been a wonderful mood lifter and way to feel connected to other witchy folks across the globe. Not to mention, so informative and fascinating. Aw, thank you, Hope. I am a cis queer woman whose presentation runs the gamut of feminine and masculine. As I've been building my practice, I struggle to truly listen to my intuition and stay connected to source. I think this has to do with my social conditioning that has deeply severed my ability to access my own inner divine femininity. I can access my inner toxic and healthy masculinity, and I can access my toxic femininity, that which is reinforced by patriarchal gender roles, such as overextending myself to care for others, performing femininity for others, etc., but I struggle to access that healthy femininity, which I believe is an essential part of witchcraft, like feeling in my body, trusting my intuition, being myself without shame, being willing to ask for what I need and set boundaries, etc. 
Do you have any rituals or spells you recommend to reignite the divine feminine within? Any deities you suggest to get in touch with? I am a patron of Demeter, but open to expanding. Thank you so much. Hi, Hope. Well, you are in luck because the last third of today's episode is all about feminine deities from different paths and different moments in history. So perhaps one of the goddesses that Naja speaks about will call to you. But I also want to acknowledge that I know that some people really struggle with the gender essentialism that so often exists in spiritual practice. And I just want to remind you that you get to define what masculinity and femininity mean to you in your material life and in your magical life. So if for any reason working with goddesses other than Demeter just isn't feeling like home for you, you don't have to do it at all. There are plenty of deities who read quote-unquote masculine, but who are all about healing and nature and magic. So since you started us in the Greek pantheon, I'll just call out some names. There's Apollo, god of medicine and music and the sun. I'm thinking of Asclepius, the god of healing. I'm thinking of Hermes, who many folks read as queer or non-binary because he or they are a deity of magic, liminality, and boundary crossing. But if adding a relationship with a goddess to your practice feels like what you really need right now, then I gotta bring up my Lady Artemis yet again, my matron goddess. She's the Greek goddess of the moon and the wild and independence who is notorious for not settling down with a dude. Some say she's a virgin goddess. Some say she reads queer since she pretty much exclusively hangs out with her retinue of nymphs and protects young girls and mothers. But pretty much everyone thinks of her as self-belonging, nature-loving, and free. Having said that, if Artemis isn't clicking with you for whatever reason, I think that adding just a general lunar practice to your work might be super helpful. Because yes, while there are moon deities of all genders in different pantheons, lunar magic in a modern witchcraft context tends to be associated with the divine feminine. The moon is associated with intuition, emotion, mystery, and enchantment. And so I recommend adding some kind of lunar ritual to your life. You can start by lighting a candle each month to celebrate the new moon or the full moon or both. Or maybe you want to light a candle every evening to celebrate whatever phase the moon is in. And whenever you're ready to expand, there are so many other rituals and spells that you can add to this. And we actually had a wonderful conversation about moon magic on this very show with Sarah Faith Goddess Diener. So you might want to go back and listen to that conversation or pick up her book, which is called The Moon Book. Keep me posted, and I'm sending you lots of lunar love in the meantime. Now, on to my guest. Naja Lightfoot is a multi-award winning writer. She is the author of the best-selling book, Good Juju, Mojo's Rights and Practices for the Magical Soul, and her new book, Powerful Juju, Goddesses, Music, and Magic for Comfort, Guidance, and Protection. Naja is a regular contributor to the Llewellyn Annuals, and she is a contributor to the Library of Esoterica, Volume 3, Witchcraft, co-edited by yours truly. Naja's magical staff is on display and part of the permanent collection of the Buckland Museum of Witchcraft and Magic, located in Cleveland, Ohio. She is also a fellow of the Sojourner Truth Leadership Circle, sponsored by Auburn Seminary. 
Najad joined me from her home in Denver, Colorado, via Zoom. Naja Lightfoot, welcome to The Witch Wave. Thank you, Pam. Thank you for having me. I am so excited to be here. And also thank you to all your wonderful listeners. I hope that we're going to have a good time together. I know we will. And I'm very excited to be here today. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Naja. I'm so thrilled to have you here. I've been wanting to speak with you for such a long time. And I have been familiar with your work for a long time. But I am so thrilled that now you have a new book to discuss. This is your book, Powerful Juju, Goddesses, Music, and Magic for Comfort, Guidance, and Protection. But as I told you off mic, I also want to speak about your first book, Good Juju, just to give people the foundations and ground people in your orientation toward magic. So I thought we would begin with a kind of definition of terms, if you don't mind. You have the word juju in both of your books. I know you're talking a lot about hoodoo and that perspective of spirituality and magic making. When you describe your own magic or your own identity, what words do you use these days? Well, the word juju just came to me because it's just part of my vernacular. I pretty much felt that when I was searching for a title for my book, everybody knows what that other kind of juju is. That's kind of like a mainstream thing. I call it the anti-juju word (laughs) because I'm really always cautious about my words and the intention behind them. So I was like, well, what is good juju if everybody knows what the other is? Because they're like, oh, that's, you know, that juju. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, there's got to be good juju. And when you say good juju, people are like instantly recognize it. So my path, I'm definitely a practicing witch. My path spins out of my total dedication for the divine feminine and the goddess. And everything that I do spins out of that. And I always like to say to people, I speak for my own authentic practices. I don't represent anybody's one tradition, even though if you're a witch like we are, and you're just always immersed in study and learning and seeking, you will find your ways into different experiences. And that's what happened to me. And when I started out, it was books that I went to for help and looking at how can I grow? How can I learn? Because I'm pretty much like a forerunner, you know, in my own life Mm -hmm, (laughs) mm -hmm. as being an out of the broom closet practicing, which magic has always been a part of my life just because of who I am. So it was always the books I was drawn. And when I started writing for Llewellyn, which has been a fantastic career for me, I began writing articles. Mm. It was through my article writing and wanting to contribute and give something back to that person who maybe is wandering into a bookstore, doesn't know anybody, isn't sure, like, is this real? How does this really work? I saw myself in a role to be able to like give something back. And that's really why I wrote Good Juju, to be that touchstone for people who are seeking, but maybe they don't have a group or a coven or a community or people that they hang out with that they can sit and read about witchcraft and magic. And it was also very important to my covers. I wanted Mm -hmm. my covers to be accessible and welcoming and a book that they could leave out on their coffee table because we all have those books where you kind of put them in the library. (laughs) Well, company's coming over. Let me clean this up. (laughs) You know, as part of the, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, I do. So I wanted Good Juju to be that coffee table. Oh, what is this? You know, Mm -hmm. pick up kind of Mm -hmm. like. And it is, it's so friendly and so beautiful. You said we all know what juju is, but I have a feeling some listeners might not actually be that confident in using that word. And I've always first thought of it as a word that was kind of just mainstream. And then as I've gotten older and have learned more about things like cultural appropriation and contexts and so on, I've realized, oh, this has a distinctly Black American history. So could you unpack that for me a little bit? Yeah, sure. So. When I say good juju, I'm just coming out of my background as a Black woman growing up in a Black family. 
there's just certain words that get thrown around that I might not know, like the historical background. You know, I know there's African juju and they practice juju. That's what I've read. Mm -hmm. I've never been to Africa. We're labeled now as African Americans, or there's always these labels that change. I mean, I could tell you how many labels that have been attributed to me because of my skin color since I've been born, but sure. not necessary. So it's just something that I felt that was a comfortable place, a landing place. And in the practice of magic and witchcraft, which I found in my studies is when you really drill down into it, everybody's got some of this in their background. It's either their aunt or their grandma. It doesn't really matter to me who your ancestors were. You might have different names for your practices, but this is basically in the kitchen, in your yard, in your garden stuff that everybody can say, oh, my grandmother did this. She used to, you know, put this onion here, or we picked peas on this day, or we gathered on this night and we lit these candles and, oh, everybody's got this folk magic in yes, the background. That's right. And that's what I really try to go to. Like, this is the magic of the people. This is for people to work and use on a personal level that's comfortable and familiar to them. Of course, you can get really high up into magic and ceremonial magic and all those kinds of things. But good juju is just like, do what you need with what you got when you need to do it so that you can affect positive change in your life. Yes. So for you, juju means magic, essentially. Absolutely. And it means a connection with spirit mm. and ancestors and those who have gone before you because we don't walk this path alone and everybody has a deity or a higher power or something that they work with that helps them get over, get through. And so juju to me is actually a connection of working with that spiritual component, your spirituality, mm -hmm. however that manifests for you. And then being able to use magical practices to help you get over, get through, feel better, do some healing, bring some comfort and protection into your life. Beautifully said. Now, forgive me for asking you to sort of like go through the litany of different identities you hold. I'm only doing that to make sure that listeners understand that in your books and your life, how you are carrying yourself in the world. You, Naja, are representing several different magical paths. So we're talking about hoodoo, which roughly is Black American folk magic. And then you also are a practitioner of voodoo, which is a closed initiatory religion. And these are words that I often see people confuse, and they are absolutely not the same thing even though some practitioners of one can also be a practitioner of the other. Do you think that's clear enough or do you want to maybe help clarify a little more? Sure. Well, in terms of me, first and foremost, I'm a writer. Yes. I would write on walls <laughs> if I didn't have paper. <laughs> you know, I journal every day. I'm a writer. I have this thing that, you know, if you believe in past lives, I was a scribe and I'm the person that was in the temple and I'm just Writing all this stuff down. That's my job. I yes. have to write. Big quill pen. And quill pen. Oh my gosh. The smell of paper, the mm -hmm. whole thing, you know, mm -hmm. just colors of paper. It doesn't matter. I love to write. I love pens, crayons, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but in my heart, I'm a writer. You know, that's who I am. Yes. Then in terms of my magical practices. So yes, I'm a practicing witch. I keep to the wheel. I honor the full moon. Sometimes I may cast a circle. Sometimes I may not. I mean, when you've been at this stuff for a while, <laughs> like we, <laughs> you know, at first you have all this stuff and then you're like, you know, I'm kind of tired. Who's was going to light this candle, but you've built up a foundation yes. so you can do that. Yes. And my writing is to help people start to build that foundation, to have a practice. Everything that we do is a practice. So you gain strength and power and confidence by practicing your magic, your witchcraft. And then in terms of learning hoodoo, like you said, hoodoo is a folk magic tradition that is rooted in the Black American culture, but it also involves people who have immigrated to the United States and brought their own cultures with them and have their own folk magic. To me, hoodoo is a folk magic practice and anybody can learn it. You can do it wherever you want, take it, make it your own. Now, in terms of voodoo, which is spelled V-O-D-O-U, that is a religion. 
And it took me many, many, many years to find my way into the religion of voodoo. That is something that came to me as I walked my path with the divine Marie Laveau, who I feel very close to as a spiritual ancestor. I'm not related to her, but in terms of being a witch and a practicing person of magic, I look for icons of magic who look like me. Mm -hmm. I was extremely drawn to her as I am to Tituba, who I, you know, I've written about in my book. And so through my love and working folk magic, hoodoo, and my love for Marie Laveau, quite honestly, it was that that led me into the religion of voodoo, which I did take an initiation. Now, I live in Denver, Colorado. Mm -hmm. My voodoo society is in New Orleans. I only get down there maybe once every few years. So Mm -hmm. it really has become something that is very personal to me that I have to carry on on my own and go deeper into my practices. And when I get to New Orleans and I can be down there in New Orleans, but I live in Denver, Colorado. And so I just pull all this stuff together and it's all held together by really my daily morning ritual, which I've written about. And when I need to do an honor for Marie Laveau or for the goddess or the change of the wheel or the circle or the seasons, I just go into those spaces Mm -hmm. and I do my magic. I say my prayers, pour my water and, and keep it moving. Beautiful, beautiful. You said something earlier that I just want to make sure that I'm actually getting clearly because I know different people have so many different opinions about this. You said, and you wrote this in your book, that anyone can practice hoodoo. And I do have listeners of all different backgrounds. Many of them are white like I am. And I know certainly younger generations, people who are younger than perhaps me or you, might feel differently and might think like hoodoo is a tradition by and of black people. And so white people dabbling in it is not okay or not respectful. And I have so many listeners who just want to do the right thing. So I know you don't represent every hoodoo practitioner on earth, but I'd love for you to share thoughts about that. Well, the way I feel about it is nobody owns this knowledge. And what you got to do is you got to show respect. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're going to go out there and say, oh, this is my own practice and you don't want to acknowledge that it came from enslaved Africans or people who were very poor or sometimes hoodoo practices have Native American pieces in it. Mm -hmm. I am not Native American. I don't make any (laughs) claims to being Native American. But if you want to represent yourself as that. I think that's something different. Yes. So it's just, you got to be respectful. It's the same thing with me learning magic from people who have Celtic backgrounds and Irish backgrounds. Am I not supposed to honor the moon because I don't live in England? Mm -hmm. I don't believe that this knowledge is meant to be squandered and held and gatekeeped. But I do know 100% you got to give respect. So Even with me learning about voodoo as a religion and taking vows of initiation, which I talk about deeply in my books, that's a pretty serious thing. Sure. And there are some witchcraft traditions where you take vows of initiation. Then you are into an initiated path and that changes your life. That's very different. When you're just starting out and you're trying to learn what to do, which is how I try to present my writing, you got to start somewhere. So you just got to have respect for those who have come before you. One of the things that's very important to me, which I've learned along my way, and I wrote about in Good Juju, is pouring water to your ancestors every day. And so I do that. And that encompasses people who have gone before me, who are personal to me but also people that I've learned from, people that we stand on the shoulders of, because this world that we're living in now with social media and Google, and that is just so new. I mean, I came of age where you had to go to the library and look over your shoulder. Yes. (laughs) You wouldn't be going hashtag witches of Instagram. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. Even when you took the book up to the librarian, you probably had like National Geographic on top of it or (laughs) Or something, and you just like check it out real quick, you know. So this whole like, oh, it's so accessible. It's Mm -hmm. no, it wasn't like that. Exactly. In saying that, I just like to say, please respect those who have gone before you in whatever tradition that you're trying to study and learn from, and just use your common sense. (laughs) 
He wouldn't be like, you know, throwing digs at your grandmother or somebody's auntie. Mm -hmm. You were sitting in their kitchen and their home and they were telling you these traditions. You wouldn't be like, ah, you know, no, you'd be respectful. And Mm -hmm. that will carry you a long way. And as people who are magical and we work with spirit and we work in the realms, you better have respect for the work you're doing, because if you don't, you'll get respect handed to you. Absolutely. On that note, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. If you are a witch with discerning tastes, and I know you are, you need to visit Lilith Amberley Village Witch, where you will find a beautifully curated collection of witchy and magical items. All merchandise is carefully selected, not only for its gorgeous aesthetic and quality, but also for who and where it came from. Lilith Amberley Village Witch works with many women-owned businesses and ensures products like White Sage are gathered with ethical and sustainable methods. If you are looking for items like pendulums, jewelry, travel altars, and the like that are handcrafted by local artisans instead of mass-produced, then this is the place to shop. Like a local witch shop, Lilith Amberley also offers tarot readings and serves as a resource hub for witches and aspiring witches alike. Exclusive VIP list members get access to it all, including free ritual and spell guides and special offers like 50% off your first tarot reading. And Witch Wave listeners get something extra special, 10% off all your merchandise orders for Ever. All you have to do is go to lilithamberley.com slash witchwave to sign up for free and get all the details, including your 10% off Witchwave code. And now, a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Now look, I'm an air sign with anxiety, so I confess I'm sometimes stuck in my head and focused on stress and problems more than I'd like. But in addition to witchcraft, I have found therapy to be incredibly supportive because it helps me focus on solutions when I'm faced with a problem rather than just staying stuck in this feedback loop of focusing on what's hard. I've been in therapy myself for years, and talking to a therapist really helps me shift from a mindset of resisting what is into a mode of acceptance and problem solving, which has been such a relief. And that's why I'm so glad that BetterHelp exists. BetterHelp is an online platform for therapy, which means that it's convenient, accessible, and affordable. And that also means that more people can benefit from talking to a therapist. Being in therapy myself over the years has helped me manage my anxiety and PTSD because it provides me with an impartial, caring person whose sole job is to offer support with emotional challenges. Therapy has also helped me accomplish my goals, whether big or small. Quitting my corporate day job a few years back and writing my book, Waking the Witch, and starting this very podcast were all really exciting and also extremely nerve-wracking, and I truly don't think that I would be as fully actualized as a person doing what I love now without having had that help. And I want that for everyone. So if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option because you can do it virtually. To get started and matched with a therapist who you click with, you just need to fill out a brief survey and remember that you can switch therapists at any time. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash WitchWave today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash WitchWave. Be well with better help. Welcome back to the WitchWave. Today I'm speaking with Naja Lightfoot. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about hoodoo. You have, in your first book and in your new book, Powerful Juju, 
spells and different practices that you recommend for the reader. And in your first book, you talk about another tradition, which again, I think some people may be familiar with this word, but not actually be using it correctly. And that's the word mojo. And at the beginning of your chapter on mojo, you actually talk about some of the pop culture people who popularized this word and also gotten it a little bit wrong. So what have people gotten wrong about mojo and what is it exactly? So mojo is a charm. It's a talisman to help you affect change to a condition in your life. And it was really crazy. Like in the book, I say, Austin Powers lost his mojo and then, you know, he couldn't do his thing. Yeah. And everybody was like, oh, I've lost my mojo. And you hear people saying that all the time. And so it's become this thing that, oh, I lost my mojo, which people interpret to say, I've lost my power. I don't mm-hmm. have my thing. Mm-hmm. In saying it in that way, yeah, okay, you lost your mojo. Yeah, you're kind of freaked out. But in the tradition of hoodoo, a mojo is actually a charm bag. Mm -hmm. It's a bag and this crosses over into other folk magic traditions that you put petition papers in, you can add herbs in there, oils, you bless it. There's certain conditions that we work with in hoodoo and folk magic traditions. And usually those are just the basic conditions of life, Mm -hmm. money, prosperity, love, protection, success. So you make mojos for those conditions. And They can be different colors of flannel. They can be different materials. What you put in them is made in conjunction with the condition that you're using to work it for. And then you carry it. You keep it with you. So if I lost my mojo, (laughs) yeah, I'd be upset. One of the things that I wrote about in Good Juju was when we were in London and my husband got very ill. And one of the things that I first started making were safe travel mojos. Yes. I just love it. Yes. And then we were in London and my husband got very ill and I had left my backpack and really important things, but I always kept my travel things on my person. But I was just devastated. And here I was in London, you know, in a strange place. My husband was ill and I sat down, you know, and I was bawling my eyes out. What the hell good is my safe travel mojo? I've lost my shit. Now what am I supposed to do? And this bag, you left it in a taxi, right? I left my backpack in the taxi. So, you know, I had my safe travel mojo on me, but I was still like, hey. (laughs) Yeah. And then about a half hour later came a knock on the door and the cab driver had come back and he brought my bag back to me and we just bawled. Mm. And it was like, okay, my mojo, it was working for me. I had that moment where I really had to like test my beliefs and Mm -hmm. things that I've practiced for years. And we were able to move on. My husband recovered and I still have that same safe travel mojo. So yeah. So wonderful. I love stories like that. And I'm so glad that it worked and I'm not surprised at all because I know how powerful you are. (laughs) So you also talk about two different sites where a lot of magical practice takes place. And I'd say this is true of a lot of different traditions I'm familiar with, but certainly in the tradition of hoodoo. One of these sites is the crossroads, and one of them is the cemetery. Can you share a little bit about how you work with these two, I would call them liminal spaces or portals? Yes, absolutely. So a crossroads is anywhere that Two roads intersect in a T. And a lot of this magic that we do, hoodoo, that we talk about folk magic, you have to remember these practices come from people who lived in rural areas. Yes. Their graveyard where their ancestors and loved ones were buried, it was probably just down the road. Mm -hmm. Most of us now, we're city people. I'm a city woman. You know, Mm -hmm. I've always lived in the city. So when I get ready to step into the crossroads, I'm like probably just going down the block. (laughs) I mean, New York City is all crossroads. It's all crossroads, (laughs) you know? One of my first powerful crossroads magics that I did was in Philadelphia Mm -hmm. in a huge city. But when you start to do this work, cemeteries in rural areas were usually open. You could just hop over the gate. Now you want to do cemetery. It's probably locked. You probably need to check out how you can come in and out of there. Mm -hmm. But this is why all of your work for me is grounded through a higher power. I never do any of this magic without first saying my prayers to the goddess for protection, 
or whoever your deity is, because when you do step into these liminal spaces, the spells that I've written about require you to go out there at midnight yes. or early in the morning. One of the things I first learned was from a wonderful lady when I was studying hoodoo. She was like, you got to put yourself in it. And that's really when you get powerful is when you do these things and then you tweak it for how it works for you. So if you live in a city like I do, if you're going to step into the crossroads, you should check it out in the day, Mm -hmm. in the nighttime, then go out there at that hour that you want to do it because things look very different at night than they do in the day. That's right. And in a cemetery, the same thing. When you go into a cemetery to do work, you should be familiar with where you're going and how it opens and go spend some time in that cemetery. We always throw coins to the gatekeepers. Yes. That's a symbol of respect. Mm -hmm. Take yourself in there and sit down, be with the spirits in the cemetery before you even attempt to do the work. Because again, that's respectful of those spaces. And so as people who work in the unseen, and we spend a lot of time doing magic, You have to be acknowledging those spirits who are in those spaces, especially if you're going to call on them to help you in your life. Right. And that's what you're really doing. That's what I write about is how to do this magic to help you in your life. But if you're going to go in there like, you know, you're just the baddest bitch on the planet, (laughs) you know, (laughs) Mm -hmm. whatever, and you can just show up. You're the baddest magician in the planet. And you're like, hey, you know, I want you to do this. No, that's not going to work. Exactly. Not going to (laughs) work. These are people who have crossed over. So why would you treat them any differently than you would treat a stranger requesting help or assistance or guidance? Of course, you would do that respectfully and maybe even a little trepidatiously. And you'd offer a gift or say thank you in some way. I mean, I always call it having good magical manners. Exactly. It's basic stuff, right? Right. And not just that, when you're in the cemetery, you're there with people's family members. I mean, if you can't have respect at that level, then I don't really know what you're doing in there. Yeah. Now, the crossroads is different. When you're going to the crossroads and you're in the street, (laughs) like I am, Mm -hmm. you know, in the city, you should definitely be checking it out. You should drive through there a couple of times and get to know the area around there where you're going. Sometimes here in Denver, where I live, I live in Colorado and Denver, we can kind of get out into rural areas kind of quickly. So there are a few places where we can go. I will tell you, though, one of my favorite crossroads is a railroad track. (gasps) Oh, my gosh. It just thrills me to no (laughs) end to go across a railroad track. That's just powerful (laughs) juju. You see the train go across and lights start going. And, you know, you're just like, oh, it says Mm crossroad where it comes together in the sign. So I love railroad tracks. I'm a big train freak. How wonderful. One of the things that I loved that you wrote about in your book, too, is the idea of always taking a different route home from some of these liminal places. And I know the answer to this, but I'd love to hear you riff on why it's always a good idea to go home a different route if you can from these spaces. Well, you go home a different route and you don't look back which is super hard to do. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we've heard the myths. You've heard you don't want to myth, right? yep, go back into Hades or be turned into a pillar exactly, of salt. Exactly, right? And now we all have cars because I don't know who's walking to the crossroads unless you are blessed to live in a rural area. So you get in your car and what's the first thing you do? You look in your rear view mirror. So if you're practicing, it takes you a while to know, like, before you get out of the car, you better turn your mirror around. Oh, yeah. So you don't look at it when you get in the car. It's very hard to do. So I do that. I pull my side mirrors in and I turn my rear view mirror around. Wow. And you drive all the way home that way or just? No, just out of the cemetery. Okay. So you don't look back because that is a statement of faith that you've done your work. And spirit is working now on your behalf and Mm -hmm. you've got to let go. You've got to let it go. You've done all your work. You've done all your prayer, your prep. You've showed up. You've asked for spirit to help you. Don't look back. Just let it go. Trust. Just trust. Surrender. Just surrender. And then the other part about going home a different route is so they won't follow you out. (laughs) (laughs) Scramble. (laughs) 
<laughs> just to be safe. Just to be safe. And it's also good for you because it also breaks that link with the magic that you've done when you go home a different route. Your mind has to think about something else. Mm-hmm. You're just not going home rote. So put your mind in a different place. Okay, I've done this work. I'm going home a different route. I got to concentrate on how I'm going to get home now. So it also gives you that ability to kind of ease down because you're driving home a different way or walking home a different way because you've got it ground back down because it's heavy magic. And, you know, it's also a a thrill. Yes. Wow, I've been out here at midnight (laughs) in the crossroads. Gone in the graveyard and I've done all this stuff. And so you feel really like, you know, you're just like charged charged. and that's a wonderful feeling, but you do need to come down from that. So you got to give yourself some time and be kind to yourself and go home by a different route. Yes. I'm mindful of the fact that by the time this episode airs, it will be autumn, which we often say it's the time when the veil between worlds is thinnest. We've all heard it a hundred million times at this point. But I imagine that that's a really excellent time to do crossroads rituals or cemetery rituals. What would you maybe recommend for either of those spaces during this season? Well, since I practice so many different ways, all of us practicing witches, we're super busy when October comes. Oh my gosh, every other day, there's some kind of event going (laughs) on. So since I do honor my ancestors every day by pouring water to them in the morning, I'm actively honoring my ancestors all the time. Mm -hmm. So during that season, I might set up a table where I pull their pictures out put them all on a table in Samhain. People might call it a dumb supper where Mm -hmm. you set a place for those who've gone before and you make them feel welcome. You bring out things that were special to them. You make food that's special for them. I might do that and set up something nice, but my ancestors are always around with me, but I probably would make a special place and altar for them. Mm -hmm. So I would do that during Samhain. And this is in your home as opposed to a cemetery, right? Right. Yeah. This would be my home. This is my personal celebration. Sometimes people have Samhain celebrations with their coven or their group where they go somewhere and then they're all doing it together. Those are great events. I've been to many of those. There's witches balls going on and public ceremonies at midnight. So there's all kinds of things like that that'll happen. Then in the voodoo tradition, there's Fet Gede, which is honoring the Lua who watch over the cemetery. And that's a wonderful celebration to celebrate the ancestors. And I've been blessed to participate in those in New Orleans a couple of times. And that's a really magical thing. And that usually happens on November 1st. Mm -hmm. And then I know there's a tradition of Dia de los Muertos that Mm -hmm. people who are of that faith They have their practices that they do. I've been invited to some of those celebrations and they make the beautiful ofrendas with the altars and the marigolds. Stunning, stunning. So you can just run from one day, (laughs) one thing to the next. I could participate in some of those and I could participate in none of them. Mm -hmm. It just depends on where I happen to be, Mm -hmm. what I'm doing that particular time. And sometimes, honestly, I like to keep it real. There's been a lot going on for people these last few years. Yes. You might come this season or seasons past, especially the last few years with COVID and the pandemic, you might just be super tired. And you might just say, I think I'm just going to get this candle, maybe get some flowers, maybe write a little thing, put some names on a paper and I'll light it tonight, have a conversation, make an offering and call it good. Mm -hmm. Because as a real practicing person, all of these events that happen, yeah, they're super cool. They're super fun. They take a lot of work. They take a lot of energy. Yes, they do. You're just drained when it's all over. Mm -hmm. But really what you're going for as a magical practitioner or a practicing witch or a person who's into magical spirituality is develop a personal relationship with your magic. And nothing is more sincere than you just saying, I'm just going to light this candle. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to think about my ancestors. I'm going to make an offering and then I'm going to go to bed. And maybe tomorrow I'll get up and I'll feel more energetic because nothing is worse than like trying to do all this stuff when you're super tired or you just don't feel like it. Maybe you recently had someone cross over and you're grieving. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a heavy time of year Mm -hmm. and you might not feel like you can do all of that from your own state of grief. It might just be enough for you to just take a moment and say, maybe this person who passed over is just really present in your heart right now. And you're not doing the big events and stuff like that. You Mm got to honor your own humanity. Yes. You know what I'm saying, Pam? I absolutely do. Thank you for that. On that note, we're going to take another quick break and we'll be right back. 
fall is here. And with the cool autumn air and darkening evenings comes an ancient tool for creating the perfect sacred setting or cozy moment. Of course I'm talking about Mithras candles. These pure beeswax lights are inspired by the modern science of photobiology, along with ancient pagan practices and cosmic mysteries. Mithras candles are handmade by my mythic and scientific pals in Philadelphia and come in traditional golden yellow and sensual black hues, with other colors and collaborations popping up seasonally. You will be hooked like I am once you experience the gorgeous Byzantine hand-dripped style of a Mithras candle and their honeyed floral aroma. Go to MithrasCandle.com to pick up the perfect glowing addition to your Mabin moments and more. And best of all, Witchwave listeners get 18% off their first order by using offer code WITCH at checkout. That's offer code WITCH at M as in magic, I-T-H-R-A-S, Candle.com. Blessed Be Magic believes that being a witch is all about working with your personal power. Have you ever wanted to celebrate who you are with stunningly beautiful yet minimalist witchy jewelry? Then you've got to check out Blessed Be Magic. They create modern and minimalist jewelry for witches to remind you of your power. And what I love about them is that they are elegant and subtle so you can bring your magic with you everywhere. Take their tiny pentacle necklace, for example, which is one of their most beloved pieces. Its minimalist yet elegant design makes this the perfect everyday talisman for today's witch. And it's really not hard to understand why Blessed Be Magic has over 900 five-star reviews from witches all over the world. Check them out at blessedbemagic.com, that's magic spelt M-A-G-I-C-K, and use the code WITCHWAVE for 15% off your first order with them. Shipping is free within the USA, and they also ship worldwide. So check them out. Their jewelry is just so, so lovely and so understated, yet full of power. That's Blessed Be Magic, and magic is spelled with a K at the end, dot com. I can't wait to see which pieces you choose. Would you like even more Witch Wave? Do you wish you could hear from me and my other bewitching guests on a weekly basis? Then come join us on Patreon, where you'll get bi-weekly bonus Witch Wave Plus episodes, ad-free Witch Wave episodes, and detailed show notes for all. Rewards for some tiers also include magical merch and contests where you can win witchly prizes each month, as well as early heads up about my workshops before they sell out. And all backers get access to our exclusive digital coven, where I lead monthly online rituals and where you can connect to a community of other wonderful witch wave witches around the world. So head on over to patreon.com slash witchwave and sign up. It's a fabulous way to get more magic in your life and to support the show. Thank you so much. Welcome back to The Witch Wave. Today I'm speaking with Naja Lightfoot. So Naja, you said that we have gone through a really tough time collectively as a people, as a global society what with the pandemic and so many other hardships, particularly over the last few years. And your new book, Powerful Juju, Goddesses, Music, and Magic for Comfort, Guidance, and Protection, brought me so much comfort and such a feeling of delight as I was reading it. And so I wanted to know what your intention was with this book. And were you, in fact, writing it during the pandemic? I was writing this book during the pandemic, and it was really difficult. 
Mm. It was very hard. There was so much going on in everybody's lives. Yes. And I am just grateful to everyone who loved Good Juju and have given me such wonderful feedback. Good Juju was meant to be that entry way, that way for you to start, that way for you to feel comfortable in doing some magic. And then I wanted to go deeper. I wanted to talk to people like, all right, you know, I've told you now you need to have a foundational practice. You need to be consistent with it. However, that consistency works out for you. I hope you're doing some of these things and that you felt comfortable. But now I want to talk to people about the hard stuff when you can really use the practices to help you and share with people things that have helped me. And I also really wanted to talk about the power of the divine feminine and the power of music that is so healing. I just love music and the songs and the playlists. And I also, from my heart, wanted to give people a way to touch with me. I got that a lot through Good Juju, that people really wanted to get closer to me and what I'm doing. So I thought, well, I could take the music that I turn to and the divine feminine, the icons of the divine feminine that bring me comfort. Maybe I could marry the two Mm -hmm. and create this magical playlist brew of Hetty. (laughs) Let's get down into it. Listen to this song. Put your headphones on. Blast this music. And also give people kind of like a stair-step way where you could just listen to the music and you could feel magical. Then you could read the chapter and you could do the spells. Then you could play the music and make a sacred space. So Najah, before we keep going, I want to just talk about how you've organized the book so people understand. The book is divided into 12 segments. There's intro and outro parts too. Each chapter is devoted to a different being, someone you call a goddess, though some of these are literal goddesses in the way that most people are familiar with that word. And then some of them are people who have crossed over who mean a lot to you, people like Frida Kahlo and Nina Simone and other divine feminine beings. And then for every chapter, you also have a song that you've selected to complement the goddess you're highlighting and the type of magic that you associate with that goddess. So it's really beautifully organized. And I'll tell you, when I was reading your book, I was listening to your playlist on YouTube, and it really just gives this extra rich texture to it. I loved that experience. Oh, I'm so glad, Pam. That's so great. That's what I was hoping. I wanted to write something that people could actually really feel emotionally besides just reading the words, something that they could also find comfort when they were doing the magic, whatever magic they were doing. I do talk about some hard stuff like jail time, Mm -hmm. court cases, heartbreak, things like that, that can be pretty serious. But then there's some light stuff like trying to get some cold money, you know, some hard (laughs) cash. Everybody likes to get paid. Yes. Let's just keep it real. Or when you feel, you know, you've been put upon and you just feel like you're really down. You know, music is just so wonderful for that. And I thought this would be excellent to actually get you comfortable before you decide to step off and do the spell. You have this music that you could surround yourself with. And you would know, too, that I listened to this music. Yes. And that I did this spell work myself. Yes. These are songs deities, women who lived, women who've crossed over, goddesses. I call them goddesses from my own definition because I think they're all fabulous. And I wanted to bring them out into the world and have them be recognized for their contributions and show people you could work with them respectfully and get your groove on and practice this magic to try to help yourself or others. Absolutely. And then each chapter is further divided. You'll talk about the goddess that you've selected. Let's say it's Lilith. You'll talk about the intention or the spirit of their magic, the kind of magic that one can do working with that deity or that goddess. You talk about the song you've selected. You also walk us through a spell we can cast for or with that deity and a way to honor that deity in our space via some kind of altar or other way of saying thank you to them. So I'm tempted to highlight certain goddesses, but actually I want to trust your instincts. Is there someone who you feel compelled to call into our circle today that you've written about in the book? I would call in Sekhmet. Ooh, 
Ooh, let's go. Because Sekhmet just freaked me out when I came across <laughs> her statue. She's so powerful. And they all vie for their space. There's Titipa, mm-hmm. who just stills my heart. Mm-hmm. And Nina Simone, who, oh, the high priestess of soul. Nancy Wilson, who means so much to me. I'm talking about Nancy Wilson from Ohio, the jazz singer. Yes. And Lilith and Doreen Valiente. Yes. Sybil Leak. I have to say all their names. Oh, keep going. Mama Marie Laveau, who I call Mama Marie. And Maman Brigitte. I have to talk about Abundantia, money and income and all of them. And I say their names every day. They're with me every day. And I'll add for you, Sulis Minerva, the bath oh my goddess. Gosh, Ooh, yes. I love her. Oh, I do. And when I paired her song with Janis Joplin singing Ball and Chain at the Monterey, yes. <laughs> Monterey Jazz Pop Festival footage is just unbelievable. And normally I'd say all their names in a row. Mm. It's hard to pick them out. It's like it's become a chant yes. for me. The chant is Lilith, Frida Kahlo, Mama Marie, Mama Brigitte, Sekhmet, Titipa, Sulis Minerva, Nina Simone, Nancy Wilson, Abundantia, Sybil Leak, Doreen Valiente. Oh, beautiful. And what an incredible coven of magical divine feminine beings. Now, how did you go about selecting them for this book? Was it intuitive? Are these deities you've worked with for a long time? I'd love to know how you formulated this. They were deities that I'd worked with for a long time personally and also through the music. I've always been someone who's got music going all the time. I've got 10 different sets of headphones. Whatever new thing that the music was on, that's what I had. And one person that really helped me get over there is an artist. Her name is Amethyst Kia, Mm. and she plays root music. I happened to be at Swallow Hill here in Denver back in 2019, and I love bluegrass music. So it kind of goes with my magical practices. I like it all. You know, I listen (laughs) to everything. Yes, eclectic (laughs) witch. I like classical music. I like rock. I like R&B. I like soul and I like root music bluegrass music and that's because my maternal line hails from West Virginia and Mm. it's just in at Appalachian let's get on a washboard get the spoons going even though I didn't really grow up around that music but when I hear it I'm home. And so Amethyst Keo was singing this song, Dig, about, you know, we got to dig a hole because we got to put Darlin' Corey down and she sings so powerfully and I was just transcendent. I was like, oh my gosh. And so it was a calling. Mm. I think I could find my way in this music through her. And then also, as I said in my book, one day I was kind of having a hard time and I was in a bar and hanging out and dear person said, you know, you can listen to the jukebox through your phone. And I was like, what? (laughs) So I'm scrolling and I come across Stevie Ray Vaughan, you know, Mm. couldn't stand the weather. (laughs) And during those times. I did write this book during the pandemic. There was some heavy shit going on in the world. Yeah. That was a rough day. I was having some rough times and it was comforting to me. Everybody else felt in those moments at Swallow Hill and then in the bar, everybody just kind of started grooving. I was like, as a magical person, I thought this is magic. Mm -hmm. I want to put this together and make it accessible in a way for people to help themselves get comfort or call in protection if they need to. And that I just put my head down and cried my way through some of those chapters. Yeah, yeah. All that stuff was happening and they were all talking to me and I'd have to do some of those spells myself and still do sometimes. Yeah. And and it was a unique book to put together. Yeah. I think that a lot of people are also going to read this book, not only armed with this new knowledge and fortification of these 12 beings that you've highlighted, but also feel empowered to do this with their own pantheon. I certainly have different artists like Remedio Savaro and Leonora Carrington or yes. different writers that are in my personal constellation people that I consider goddesses as well as my actual goddesses that I work with actively. And so I just love how you put it together. I really love how sensitively you've written about all of them. And I love the joy 
as much as it's a book about pain and fortification and the kinds of magic that we can do when we're in those times of strife or trouble, it's also really fun and a real celebration of art and healing as well. So I just wanted you to know that comes through too. Oh, thank you so much, Pam. I appreciate that. Now, something you write about in both of these books, and this is going to be one of my final questions for you, is the idea of keeping your magic a secret or at least private. And in this age of Instagram and people sharing their altars online all the time and all (laughs) kinds of snaps of like the rituals they're doing and public rituals and stuff. And look, I really personally appreciate that more people are living out and proud. And I think it's making a lot more of us braver and seeing each other and being seen all of the good stuff. But there's also a shadow side of a lot of shadow sides of social media and oversharing. So Why do you think it's important that people keep some of this for themselves? Honestly, when you're doing magic, you're entering to this relationship with spirit and your deities, and you don't really know how that's going to turn out. You don't know how that's going to affect you. So I have found that it's more powerful to like do the magic, wait and see how it turns out. And then if you want to share about it, that's great. But there was a reason why before we had social media, people didn't know what people did or how they did it or why you take vows that you keep something secret. Not everything needs to be shared. And we also know, too, with social media, I'm on social media, of course, Mm -hmm. that a lot of stuff we do, it's been edited. It's been made for that shot. You thought about it. And magic is in the moment. So it's not that you can't tell people about it, but I have found that when you're really doing powerful work, like I write about in Powerful Juju, you probably want to keep that to yourself, especially if you're doing it for something that's really powerful or for somebody else until you know how it manifested. Then Mm -hmm. if you want to talk about it, go right ahead. Mm -hmm. But it is great to be able to share all this stuff that we can now. But there are also people who it may not be safe for them to talk about their magic. That's right. Not everybody can just come out and say, oh, yeah, I'm a practicing witch and I do hoodoo and I go to a voodoo ceremony. Well, that's fine for me, but that might not be fine for my neighbor or your coworker, Mm -hmm. Employer. Yeah. Your employer. You have to like be sensitive to people's things. And also when you're doing magic, you want to do it in a space where you're comfortable because if you have naysayers around who are like poo-pooing what you're doing, You get that negative, like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Or also what we found, which is a heavy thing a lot of us deal with now on social media, is the like, the don't like, the comments, the negativity. So now you put this really great work you're doing, and then you've got, who knows? It may not even be a person. It could be a bot. Now they're attacking your work. That's hard. Mm -hmm. It's really hard. And Mm -hmm. those of us who have been at it for a while, you grow a thick skin, but still criticism, negative feedback. And it does seem to be like sometimes now in the world, social media, you know, it has a real toxic vibe to it. Mm. So, you know, if you're doing this work, I would just say, think about what you want to share, when you want to share, why you want to share it. Mm -hmm. There's some things, you know, you may not ever tell anybody what you do. That's good. (laughs) Exactly. I agree. I agree. So Naja, in our final moments together, do you have any words, rituals, suggestions, any final thoughts that are coming to your mind that you feel called to share with us? I would just like to say that when you feel this calling, it's true. And ignoring it sometimes can bring you heartache and going forward in it can bring you heartache. It's definitely a path that's not for the faint of heart, but it will bring you rich rewards if you just listen to it and try to take your time with it. And give yourself permission to go slow Mm. and don't try to do everything at once. Do what works for you. What doesn't work for you, feel fine to say, that's just not for me. I'm going to do it this way and just keep going with it because it is so richly rewarding. It's fun. It's exciting. And it belongs to the hands of the universe. So I wish everybody successful works. Ah. Beautifully said, beautifully said. So mote it be. Ninja, I know people are going to want to connect with you. Are you mostly present online or is it through your books? How do you want people to connect with you? I'm mostly present online. I pretty much live on Instagram now. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Instagram is great. 
find me on Instagram. I also have a Facebook page. You can drop me a line on my Facebook page, Instagram at Najah Lightfoot. I'm on Facebook at Najah Lightfoot. I have a website, Craft and Conjure. You can go out there and look at that. I have a contact page there. You can drop me a line and come see me at an event. Hopefully I'll be showing up in your city somewhere soon, you know, come out and say hi to me and let me know how you're doing. Absolutely. Well, I am just so delighted by you. I'm so inspired by you. I'm so happy your books are out in the world. Congratulations on this beautiful new one. And thank you so much for being on The Witch Wave. Thank you, Pam. Thank you so much. And thank you to all your listeners. It's been a real joy. Thank you. That's it for the show. Thank you again to Naja Lightfoot for sharing her shining spirit and spirits with me. Do you have questions, feedback, need some witchly advice, or just want to share something magical that happened to you recently? Drop us an email at witchwavepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you, and you just might make it on The Witch Wire. The Witch Wave is a phantasmophile production written and produced by me, Pam Grossman. This episode was recorded and edited by Josh Wilcox, and myself. Our theme music is the song Hand and I by Lycanthia. Special thanks go to Matt Freeman, Laura Antal, and Cece Pascal. You can check out information about this and other episodes on our website and now by Witchwave merch at witchwavepodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app and give us lots of sparkly stars. It really, truly makes a difference and helps other people find the show. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WitchWavePod. And you can check out my witch emoji for iPhone by going to witchemoji.com or downloading it in the App Store. Please consider ordering my book, Witchcraft, or picking up my book, Waking the Witch, which is available everywhere now. And if you want more Witch Wave or you would just like to support the show, please join us over on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash witchwave. Thank you so much for listening. Witches are the future. I'll catch you next time on The Witch Wave.